Hello everyone this is part 9 of what if Naruto was trained by Black Zetsu, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. Naruto dodged left and landed lightly on the balls of his feet as he'd been taught, ready to move at a moment's notice. The fist that transited the space he'd just occupied swung around in an arc, and he ducked to avoid being clothes leaned before jumping up as the ground beneath him shattered. Sunid's training was all about avoiding taking a hit, as once the medic was incapacitated, there was no one else available to heal the team. Naruto wasn't entirely sure why he was still being forced to go through these motions as he wasn't technically a part of the medic nin training program, but between Jiraiya and Sunid, he'd had no choice in the matter, as he'd learned on their first day of training, pissing off the slug Sanon was a bad idea. He'd thought that utilizing the attack prevention technique to tackle her avoidance training was a stroke of genius, right up to the point where she'd shattered the ground with her strength, plucked his stunned body from the earth like a turnip, and then broken his ribcage with a single punch. After hospitalizing and then healing him, she'd warned him to rely only on his reflexes, not ninjutsu, or the consequences would be severe. Resigned to trying to get on her good side, and apprehensive of what, severe consequences, would entail if a broken ribcage didn't qualify, Naruto had acquiesced then and there. He was a survivalist, after all, and despite his initial opinion that Sunid was past her prime, it was quite evident that her abilities surpassed his in every way. He almost regretted making an enemy of her now, though the hell she put him through during their training sessions kind of made up for it. The medical program that Jiraiya had instigated and Sunid was heading was actually being done in two stages. Sunid was the overall head, of course, but much of her time was spent assessing and teaching those she deemed capable of becoming field and combat medic nin. It was the grouping the slug Sanon had initially lumped Naruto into, along with Ino, Hanata, Neji, and a bunch of other people the blonde hadn't known. Much to Sunid's disappointment, Naruto didn't possess the requisite chakra control necessary to be a medic nin. Granted, it was leaps and bounds ahead of where he'd been in his final days at the academy, a fact which he attributed to practicing both the Shinra Bansho and bottling his gaseous poisons, but not quite where the older blonde required her pupils to be. Ino, with the Yamanaka clan's refined sensory skills, and Neji and Hanata, with the Huga's classic Jukan teachings, fit much more appropriately into that category. He was also unsuited for the other half of the medical program's route, which Shizun had been placed in charge of. The dark-haired woman oversaw the hospital's progress while Sunid was busy elsewhere, including recertification of doctors and nurses and training them in new medical techniques and procedures. Additionally, she held classes for up-and-coming medical professionals, shinobi and civilian alike, a program which his former teammate Sakura was enrolled in. Rejected from both aspects of the rejuvenated medical program, Naruto had hoped that he would be freed from the burden of working alongside Sunid. Unfortunately, the older blonde had decided that his botanical and medicinal knowledge, which she'd learned the extents of upon interrogating Eno after class one day, he'd found out later from his teammate, qualified him as an honorary medic of sorts, one who could provide effective, if chakra-less, support in the field, which meant that he was still stuck under her personal tutelage. Pay attention, barked the Sanon, and Naruto's focus returned a little too late to fully avoid her strike. Her fist connected with his arm, and the blonde yelled in pain as bone shattered. Mouthing expletives, he held his injured arm with the opposite limb, noting that Sunid's hit had not only broken at least his radius and ulna, but also dislocated his shoulder. HMPH, quick you're crying, that was just a love tap. Love tap, my ass, he muttered in a strained voice. Don't daydream, Sunid told him as she approached and fisted her hands on her hips, though her tone lacked some of the bite it normally held. Summoning green chakra to one hand, she scanned and healed his injury, stepping back when she was done, Naruto noted her lips were pursed, a thoughtful frown on her face. You've got a pretty high tolerance for pain and impressive regenerative abilities, even for an Uzumaki, she admitted. Naruto shrugged, flinching as he did so, she hadn't fixed his shoulder, and he had no knowledge of what the typical Uzumaki's pain thresholds or healing factors were like. The slug Sanon jerked her head at his shoulder. 
Put it back, just like I taught you. Obediently, he grabbed his bicep, pulled his arm straight out, and then shoved it back in place, grimacing briefly. Soon it gave it another quick scan before inclining her head at him. Good, but next time, don't get distracted. Naruto resisted the urge to make a snarky remark and instead nodded obediently. Right, sorry. Sunid Sama, Jiraiya Sama is looking for you. Oh, hello, Naruto kun. The blonde allowed a grin to stretch across his lips. Morning, Shizun Nesan. Unlike Sunid, the dark haired woman was easy to get along with, due in no small part to the fact that she was an accomplished poison specialist in her own right. When she wasn't busy working with the hospital staff, she would let Naruto watch her work on creating and stockpiling different poisons and antidotes that she'd learned over the years, even teaching him some of the tricks of her trade, like the best places to hide Senban and some little known ways to introduce poison into the bloodstream. Better yet, she seemed to hold no grudge over how Naruto how drugged her and Sunid and gotten them into Kanoa, in fact, he privately thought that she was grateful to be back in the Hidden Leaf Village. Naruto hoped that the fact that she'd taken to considering him a younger brother of sorts, their age gap notwithstanding, helped to solidify the familial connection he was looking to emulate with Sunid, playing a little off the bond between the two women. The Sanan grunted, yeah, when isn't he? All right, brat, you're free to go. Shizune San, he piped up when both women turned to leave, can you stay? As Sunid continued walking away, the dark-haired woman glanced at her watch before nodding. All right, Naruto-kun, but not for long, I've got a class starting soon. Okay, watch this. Running through the appropriate seals, he molded his chakra and opened his mouth, expelling, nothing. Well, did I get it? Maybe, Shizun spoke, but her voice came out high and distorted. A broad grin spread across Naruto's features at the sound. Oh, she commented, pleasantly surprised. You did it. One of Shizun's signature techniques was the Dokugiri, a poisonous cloud that the user could breathe out similar to a water or fire release technique. The main problem was that, because the poison gas was typically lethal, the user had to learn to create it outside the body, again, similar to Sutan and Katen techniques, not that Naruto had any talent in those areas, or risk being poisoned himself. That required a knowledge of poisons, which Naruto had, and practice with changing the property of chakra, which was typically aligned to a natural element, to something atypical, which Naruto did not have. As a result, Shizun had taught him the technique, but started him off by teaching him to turn his chakra into something non-lethal, in this case, helium. They had canisters of the gaseous element that the medic had allowed Naruto to take hits off of in order to get him acquainted enough with the substance to reproduce it with the poison mist technique. All right, Naruto-kun, Shizun said, her voice back to normal, I guess you can use the Dokugiri whenever you'd like now. Just remember to be careful, as you've only just gotten the hang of it. Gotcha. Thanks, Shizun Nesan. No problem, Naruto-kun, but I've got to head off now. Don't forget to practice in an open environment. Sure thing, he thought, watching the older poison specialist run off. He'd added one more relevant skill to his arsenal, and even if it was in the fledgling stages, just knowing the Dokugiri was enough for the moment. Now it was time to see if he was familiar enough with his own poisons to substitute them for the helium he'd been practicing with. LLL. From the few times when Shizun had taken him down to the laboratory that comprised the medical research and development sector of Kanoa Hospital, Naruto had acquired a strong appreciation for the broad knowledge required for those people immersed in toxicology. Granted, that wasn't the only thing the medical research and development team studied, there were separate rooms for bloodwork, chakra research, and oncology, to name a few, but it was the only one he was interested in, and coincidentally, the only one the dark-haired medic would allow him access to. The toxicology lab was filled with vials of poisons, venoms, antidotes, antivenins, and antitoxins mixed and procured from a plethora of different chemicals and animals, mostly scorpions and snakes, which was probably a throwback to Kanoa's, and Sunid's, past fights against the hidden sand and Orokimaru. Despite his initial desire to experiment with some of the brews, Shizun had expressly forbidden any removal of the vials from hospital grounds, and so he'd been stuck at the whim of the dark-haired medic's schedule as far as dissecting them. When she did have time, Shizun often tasked him with determining the makeup of various toxins to see if he could recreate antidotes to them. 
It had proven difficult, if only because the animal-based poisons in the lab were quite different from the botanical ones he was used to working with, but when he'd started to make progress, the importance of understanding the countermeasures to his own poisons had become clear. While it took far more effort to create poisons with increasing complexity, it also meant that said poisons would be harder to break down and neutralize, should the inflicted be knowledgeable enough to even do so. He doubted that would ever be the case, though it didn't hurt to be cautious, but the point remained that he was learning a lot about his field and how to circumvent other poison specialists. Regardless, the sheer quantity of toxins in the lab had inspired him to garner an even more thorough understanding of poisons than he already possessed, starting with his own. Which is why he sat at his kitchen table, a set of senban laid out before him. Ready, he asked. A shadow clone sat across from him, a number of ceramic jars and several syringes arranged in front of it, one syringe was already in its hand. Yep. Okay then, he commented before picking up one of the needles and carefully inserting the poison tip into the crook of his elbow. He put down the weapon and then flexed several times, circulating the toxin around his bloodstream. If he was honest with himself, the steps to learning the dokugiri had actually inspired this current madness. Learning to reproduce helium gas by getting his body used to it had so many different applications to how he could improve himself that Naruto felt he would be remiss to not take full advantage of them. Maybe it was a little dangerous to experiment with deadly poisons on himself, his antidote-wielding clone aside, but there would be no better way to fully comprehend the symptoms he was attempting to inflict upon his enemies than by experiencing them firsthand. Besides which, this testing served two more purposes, the first of which was directly related to the Dokugiri. By getting so intimately familiar with his toxic bruise, the blonde could reproduce the effects of them with the poison mist technique, as well as create new techniques based around using them in liquid form, similar to how other ninja expelled water for suit and ninjutsu. The second was immunity to his own poisons on the off chance that such an occurrence might come to pass. He didn't plan on stopping there, either, eventually, the blonde hoped to gain resistance to the collection of toxins that Kanoa Hospital had within its possession, as well as collecting the materials necessary to neutralize anything he might come across in the field. It wasn't a matter of being prepared for the same exact poison, but to know how to analyze and break down an infecting toxin in such a way that he could create an antidote based on the knowledge he had of its components. Just one more rung on the ladder of mastering a craft as intricate as poison making. Besides, Zetsu had made huge strides in unique ninjutsu based upon how he'd integrated plants into his body, who was to say that Naruto couldn't accomplish something similar with poisons. Though if he could do such a thing without his physiology changing, that would be preferable. Naruto hummed to himself. Despite the lower concentration he'd started at, he'd expected some sort of reaction from the poison he'd injected. Already resistant to that lower dose. He wondered. Deciding to continue his experimentation, he picked up the next needle, inserted it, flexed, and waited. The process was repeated over and over, despite some of the higher doses requiring the intervention of his clone, until Naruto decided that he'd shoved enough toxic materials into his body. For one day. LLL. He was ready. For so long, he'd avoided making an issue about the missions he ran because stepping on the toes of the people who could make his life miserable was, inadvisable. Now, with almost a year and a half worth of experience learning tricks and honing his skills under the tutelage of Zetsu, and about half that time also working with Tenten and Asuma on Team 10, not to mention his more recent expertise with poisons and avoidance training, he wanted to test what he could accomplish. The main problem with this plan was that Chunin were not typically dispatched on the type of mission that Naruto wanted to take, and even if they were, it was unheard of for them to do so alone. Fortunately, the blonde had ways around that. Come on, Jiraiya-sensei, please. The white-haired Sanin stared at his pupil. Kid, you've gotta be crazy if you think I'm gonna send you on a mission normally reserved for Anbu. But I'm ready. You've gotten better, Jiraiya agreed, but you don't know that for sure. And I won't know until I try, Naruto argued. You gotta give me a chance at some point, Jiraiya-sensei, so why not now? Besides, it would be a nice birthday present. Jiraiya's expression began to reflect some modicum of guilt, and the blonde fought to restrain his smirk at the sight. Bingo, he thought. It was a bit of a gamble relying on that little teaser, especially since the date was still a couple weeks away, but given that Jiraiya seemed unusually attached to him, despite his attempts to avoid the older man, 
and that the blonde wasn't above manipulating his teacher's feelings to get his way, he'd hoped that bringing up his birthday would work towards his advantage. Prior to this, his birthdays had been nothing special, a lack of friends had pretty much assured that. Everything that was supposed to make up birthdays, presents, happiness, people who cared, had always been conspicuously absent from his life, a fact that the god I'm Hockage likely knew. Thus, by treating this request as a birthday gift and playing on Jiraiya's more sympathetic nature, he could hopefully override the man's logic and get his way. Maybe it was still early in his career considering that he hadn't even been Chunin level for a year, but Naruto had spent so much time devoting his all to improving and perfecting his abilities that he wanted to know if his efforts were producing fruit. Jiraiya released a heavy-hearted sigh. You sure you want to go down this path? Asuma told me that you didn't freeze up when you made your first kill, which is a good mindset to keep if you're gonna pursue a career in the ANBU, but taking a life in self-defense and going in knowing that's your goal are two different things. I won't know, till I try, the blonde repeated, knowing that the Hokage's resolve was slowly breaking. Teacher and student stared at each other for a long moment before Jiraiya let out a frustrated growl. Aggravating brat, he muttered. Fine. Digging through a stack of paperwork on the right side of his desk, he pulled out a single sheet and placed it before his disciple, rotating it so the blonde could read it. This is the last communication we received from a team that was stationed on the Fire Rain border. Apparently one of our Nukunan has become active enough to track down. Blue Eyes skimmed the report. Rokusho AOI. Jiraiya dropped an open bingo book over the sheaf of paper, startling the blonde. A number of years ago, Rokusho AOI tricked one of his students into stealing the Nadaim Hokage's revered Raijin no Ken and then fled Kanoa with it. Maybe Kanoa should consider better security measures, Naruto thought, recalling how easily he'd stolen the Scroll of Seals. According to our records, AOI never rose past Chunin rank, Jiraiya continued, but the sword is, well, legendary, obviously. Since he's decided to come out of hiding, I want you to find him and retrieve the sword. You can use any means necessary to do so. Gotcha, the blonde stated, grabbing the information Jiraiya had for him and putting it in a safe place for later review. Thanks, Jiraiya-sensei, I appreciate it. Naruto, Jiraiya called before the Jinchuriki left, whatever you do, don't go into Am. Hanzo doesn't take kindly to trespasses. And with those parting words echoing in his ears, Naruto was gone. LLL. The problem with taking a solo mission after working as a team for so long, Naruto discovered, was that he was used to having a support system to share the workload of the mission with. Granted, that was the very thing he was trying to get away from, so it was better to cut the ties while he could, but bad, habits were hard to break. Unfortunately, as he was finding out, not being a sensor nin on a mission hunting people, or not working with a sensor nin, made the job far more difficult. It almost made him miss having Eno around, for her sensing abilities, naturally, but this mission was his chance to prove himself, regardless of the time it would take to complete. So far, he'd been away from Kanoa for three weeks, taking his time on the journey to and then along the land of fire's border with the land of rain where AOI had last been spotted. His 14th birthday had passed a handful of days ago, in the usual silence he was accustomed to, but unlike in previous years, he'd relished the quiet. Surrounded by nature and with his mind devoted to the task of hunting down his quarry, he hadn't even given the solitude that normally permeated his birthdays any thought. Naruto's blue eyes gazed over the landscape below him, trying to spot any clue as to E's whereabouts. He'd followed crushed foliage and subtle footprints from the Kanoa campsite the Nukunan had ambushed to his current location, based on advice Asuma had bestowed upon him early in his career, but the trail had finally disappeared. The blonde let out a huff of annoyance. What next? He wondered. Jiraiya had expressly forbade him from entering the land of rain, which meant that he had to rely on his target not being within the small country. As far as options went, that left, randomly searching for the former leaf shinobi. Ugh, what a pain in the ass, not to mention that doing so required far more blind luck than Naruto was comfortable relying upon. Everyone had been worried about how he'd handle taking a life and operating as an assassin. No one had mentioned that actually getting to that point was, to borrow from Shikamaru, troublesome. Thankfully, it was a temporary annoyance. After all, tracking wasn't in his future, and pretending to be interested in Anbu was just a stepping stone to his endgame. 
The only purpose the mission served was to test his progress. Joro Senban. Naruto reacted immediately, bounding off the branch he was perched upon and performing a mid-air backflip. He settled on another thick limb, watching with narrowed eyes as a hail of Senban rained down upon his former position. Kanoa sent a kid to challenge me. Came a cocky voice from down below. I should be insulted. The blonde watched as Rokusho AOI swaggered out of the mist that cloaked the fire rain border, an umbrella held overhead and another strapped to his back. He possessed teal-colored hair which framed his face in a spiky mop and wore a gray and blue black sleeveless bodysuit that showed off his thin physique. Naruto thought he almost looked frail despite his haughty expression, though he was more impressed with the coincidence required to have his target appear before him as he was mentally debating his next move than anything else. Well, at least he could start his real objective now. AOI threw his umbrella into the air, allowing it to expand and begin twirling. Try and avoid this again, the Amnin taunted, forming a single seal and bringing forth another hail of needles. Naruto withheld a sigh, people would get so much further if they didn't project their intentions in such an obvious manner. Fingers twisting together into the appropriate signs, he held both palms out towards the incoming rain of steel, a violent wind palm dispersing the weapons. AOI grunted in displeasure. So, you've got some talent, huh? Fine. He reached back and unclasped the second umbrella from its catch, holding out his hand as the first one floated down to him. The Jinchuriki took that brief moment to throw a handful of Senban at the man from the higher ground, but the Amnin's open umbrella deflected them. He folded it up and then, with both umbrellas in hand, jumped up towards the blonde. Naruto reached into his sleeves and withdrew his hunting knives, leaping down to meet the Amnin and use the force of gravity to his advantage. They met in midair, but apparently AOI was supplementing the umbrellas with chakra, for the wind that Naruto applied to his blades couldn't cut through. Resettling upon the ground, AOI charged again, the umbrella that slashed down at Naruto being parried by the curved edge of the blonde's knife. That started an intricate dance of attack and defend that left the Jinchuriki blocking with steely-eyed concentration. Neck, hip, shoulder, he chanted to himself as AOI slashed at him, predicting the man's pattern. He jumped back when the Amnin stabbed at his stomach, but was surprised when a burst of Senban strafed from the umbrella's tip. AOI crowed as the needles shot through the blonde's clothes and into his stomach. Ha, you should have stayed in Kanoa, little boy. With the poison on my Senban now coursing through your body, you should already be feeling your body start to slow down, and soon enough you won't be able to move at all. Naruto almost snickered at the arrogance, but instead used the opportunity provided by Ease boasting to slash out with his knives. The Amnin barely managed to bring his umbrellas up in time to defend, but was too surprised to protect them with chakra, allowing the wind chakra extending from the knives tips to shear them in half and rip through Ease's bodysuit. A thin trickle of blood started leaking from the older man's wound. You, he gasped, eyes wide and furious, how? You should barely be able to stand, let alone attack. I'm familiar with poisons, the Chunin replied, tone casual. Granted, since he'd been working on making himself immune to his own poisons, his resistance to other poisons had its limits, but he could work through whatever toxin AOI used until his mission was complete. The Amnin tossed away his broken weapons and withdrew what appeared to be the pommel of a sword. How familiar are you with this? He snarled, and lightning erupted from the hilt, forming into an almost three-foot-long blade. That's got to be the rage in no ken, Naruto mused, countering his opponent's wild overhead swing by holding up his wind-imbued knives in an X shape. Wind trumps lightning. For a moment, the two remained locked in a stalemate, the blonde's wind chakra negating the Nadaim's legendary lighting sword, but unable to effectively cut a blade created from something as insubstantial as lightning chakra. Then the Amnin's blade disappeared, and the lack of resistance caused Naruto to stumble, his balance thrown. Now within his guard, AOI reactivated the sword, the blade extending towards his sternum with a discharge of electricity. Instinctively, Naruto allowed his chakra to seep into the ground. It oversaturated the earth, turning soil into slush, and the blonde disappeared into its depths, lightning scoring a jagged slice over his clavicle. Moving blindly through the underground, he reappeared 50 feet away and immediately tried to ascertain the severity of his wound. Deep. He realized upon glancing at it, watching blood seep down his uniform, and way too close. Blue eyes narrowed at his opponent, who wore a far too smug expression for his liking. 
The rage in no Ken would apparently be trickier to combat than he'd thought, given that it didn't behave at all like a regular sword. All of his practice with Tenten had made him adept at countering standard weaponry, not something chakra-based. So, if he had to fight against a non-traditional weapon, he'd fight fire with fire and play simultaneous offense and defense instead of simply waiting for an opening, to try to keep the opponent as off-balance as possible. AOI charged at him, slashing down towards his right hip. Naruto parried the blow with the knife in his right hand, then immediately lashed out with the left, forcing the Amnin to twist away and preventing him from activating any other tricks with his legendary blade. For almost a minute, the two engaged in a fierce Kenjutsu battle, AOI using his superior reach to try and finish Naruto while the blonde used his two blades to keep the turquoise-haired man from doing so. Naruto could tell that his enemy was getting frustrated at the lack of progress, but he was also getting annoyed at his own inability to end the fight. He was skilled, more so than the clown he was fighting at any rate, but physically he was at a disadvantage, not to mention he could feel his movements becoming sluggish from blood loss and or ease poison. Maybe hand to hand, or blade to blade as it was, wasn't as much his forte in the same sense that it was Lee's or Tenton's, but he should have been better than AOI, current state of the fight notwithstanding. For a brief moment, the Jinchuriki wondered what he was doing. If the fight kept going as it was, he would lose, there were too many elements not in his favor, and time was one of them. And why had he even engaged AOI in a knife fight anyway? For him, Kenjutsu was a supplementary skill, not his specialty. It was time to stop playing E's game and start playing his own. Without breaking his focus, the blonde began seeding his chakra into the ground, preparing to use the Shinra Bansho to surprise the rain shinobi. After the next exchange of block, slash, dodge, Naruto sank into the ground and moved quickly past his opponent, prepared to surface and slash his tendons with the poisoned edge of his knife. Coward, you can't hide from me. He heard AOI shout, and then the world seemed to explode in a blinding white light. The blonde blearily opened his eyes with a groan, blinking slowly to remove the spots dancing in his vision. He was lying in a pile of broken rock and churned earth, his clothing dirty and ripped in several places. His grasp on his knives had come undone, one still rested in the palm of his hand, the other was just out of reach, partially covered with dirt. He closed his fingers around the weapon immediately in his grip. They didn't move. Suddenly, his focus came back. What? His fingers attempted once again to clench around the hilt of his hunting knife, but just like before, they didn't respond. He tried moving his entire arm, lifting it to leverage himself into a sitting position, but there was no reaction. Confusion and a small amount of panic began to set in. Why can't I move? Hey, I've got you now, brat. Naruto looked up to find AOI standing at the edge of the small crater he was in. The Amnin looked slightly worse for wear, as if he, too, had been caught in the blast radius of whatever explosion had gone off. He waved the rage and no Ken in front of the Jinchuriki. I told you that you should have stayed in Kanoa. No kid can beat a Jonan of my caliber. The sword, Naruto realized. Lightning beat earth, clearly AOI had used the blade's chakra properties to channel lightning into the ground, and the resulting discharge had been strong enough to create the hole he was currently lying in, not to mention negate the attack prevention technique. It explained his body, too. During their training sessions, Sunid had once hit him with a technique called the Ranshinsho, a medical jutsu that changed how the brain interpreted the electrical signals the body sent out. When he tried to throw a kick at her, his arm had twitched instead, almost hitting himself in the face in the process. The lightning chakra utilized by the Nadaim's legendary sword must have possessed similar enough properties to roughly emulate the technique, albeit stunning the body instead of confusing it. Real panic finally settled in. He was immobile and defenseless, and AOI was not. It would take no effort to crawl down into the hole and finish him where he lay. He would never see his dreams realized, never experience the same freedom Zetsu boasted, never reach his full potential. He didn't know when AOI had moved to stand over him, but staring at the man's overconfident smirk and eyes alert with some hidden madness, Naruto felt something inside him jolt back into awareness. Fuck that, he decided, I'm not DYN here. Maybe he couldn't move or form hand seals, but maybe he didn't need that to emerge victorious, if there was one thing he knew better than all of that, it was his poisons. Yi's silver eyes gleamed with sadistic glee. Die. 
Naruto ignored the imminent death coming for him and focused on his breathing. He could feel the chakra building up in his chest, hear the pounding of his heart as he turned all of his attention to the months he'd dedicated to creating, bottling, and perfecting his poisons. Then, with a long breath, he exhaled a dokugiri. Yi's screams reached his ears when white manchineal gas entered the man's eyes and covered his skin like a cloak. Pained by the toxin, the turquoise-haired man dropped the Nadaim's legendary sword, the lightning chakra comprising the blade disappearing before the pommel hit the ground. Now, Naruto prompted himself. Using the breathing technique Asuma had showed him and the premise of the Dokugiri as baselines, he inhaled once more, this time focusing on converting the chakra in his chest into a nature form rather than a poison. When he exhaled, a great wall of sharp wind slammed into AOI. It hacked into his body, sending sprays of blood into the air and even slicing off his left arm at the shoulder. As quickly as the attack came, it dissipated into the open air, leaving behind nothing but the stillness of the moment. Yi's body fell backwards, landing in the dirt with a soft wump. Naruto heaved a sigh that was one part relief, one part exhaustion. I did it, and without seals, too. Probably should have started with that, he thought, attempting to frown, but I did it. So why didn't he feel as accomplished as he should? He didn't even get a chance to muse on those feelings before there was a presence beside him, a brief pressure at the juncture of his neck, and then nothing. LLL. When will he wake up? I already told you, when he's recovered. Now get out. Sheesh, all these years and you still don't have any bedside manners, huh? I don't have to be nice to do my job, and I'm sure you don't need legs to do yours, so get out before I break them. Naruto groaned. Shut up. The hurried clacking of shoes on linoleum reached his ears, and shortly thereafter, he could sense shadows looming over his body, shielding his eyelids from the harsh fluorescence. Naruto, exclaimed the first voice, which the blonde recognized as Jiraiya's. You're finally awake. Back off, Jiraiya, barked the second voice, and this time he repressed a shiver when he realized it belonged to Sunid. All right, kid, open your eyes. He obeyed, revealing the excited and stiff faces of the toad and slug Sanon, respectively. Clothed in a pale green hospital gown that was wide at the shoulders, he could both see and feel the bandages swathed around his injured shoulder and under his armpit. What happened? He asked as soon as performed a few basic medical checks. Jiraiya straightened up and crossed his arms. You tell me, kid. The Anbu I sent to follow you brought you back kinda messed up. You had me followed. Duh. The Sanon deadpanned. You think I'd send a Chunin out on a mission like this without some insurance? He was ordered to interfere only if your life was in imminent danger. Cut it kinda close, he groused, a strange mixture of dullness and anger coursing through his system. With how near he'd come to losing his life, he wondered if the man watching over him had truly been invested in his mission. What about the sword? He realized. Jiraiya waved a hand in dismissal. The sword and body were recovered by the ANBU, so no worries there. Now, wanna fill us in? Naruto shrugged as best he could. What's there to tell? I found AOI, we fought, he poisoned me, stabbed me. Poison. Soon it interjected, startled. Then she barked, Sakura, what did his bloodwork show? The younger blonde was surprised when his former teammate stepped out from behind Sunid and handed the older woman a file. Uzumaki-san's bloodwork showed no trace of poison, Sunid Shosho, she replied professionally. The only injuries he suffered were the gash across his clavicle, the spotting on his stomach, and some residual muscle paralysis from exposure to Raten Chakra. Sakura. She graced him with a small smile. Hey. Before the Jinchuriki could organize the multitude of thoughts rolling around his head, Sunid lowered his file and shot him a smirk over its top. Sakura was the one who healed you. She's become an excellent medical ninja since joining the program. Naruto didn't know how to respond to that, was Sunid bragging. So he remained silent, his mind a cluster of different musings. Sakura had apparently healed him, Sakura, the girl who, last he'd seen, had been next to useless at being a shinobi, was now receiving praise from Asanon for her skill. Granted, it had been a long time since he'd seen his former teammate, not since she'd left Jirai's tutelage for the hospital, but it was hard to reconcile the pink-haired girl he'd been forced to work alongside in the early days of Team 7 with the kunoiki competent enough to oversee his convalescence all on her own. It gave him confidence that he could one day achieve a feat similar to the one Sakura had. 
Soon its honey-colored eyes narrowed at him. You're sure you were poisoned? The blonde took a moment to consider. AOI had said that the Senban were poisoned, but that didn't mean that it was true. Granted, the man had no reason to lie, especially with how overconfident he'd been, but was there a possibility that he'd been wrong? Better yet, had his own experiments with poisons made it so that any other toxins in his bloodstream were diluted to nothing? Considering the extent of his experiments thus far, it didn't make too much sense, but Naruto wasn't sure he had any other explanations to offer. I thought so, he replied, the confusion in his voice real for once. Sunid grunted something likely unflattering under her breath. Jiraiya cleared his throat. Anything else? Ah, no. Like I said, pretty straightforward. I found him, we fought, I won, then the next thing I know I'm waking up here. The hockage crossed his arms over his chest. Fair enough. I'll expect a more detailed report once you're released. And, he added, making his way toward the door, even though you completed your objective, don't expect another mission like that for a long while. Naruto remained silent as the white-haired man left the room. Not being given another assassination mission was fine by him, he had too much to think about in the meantime. Reviewing his fight with AOI, the blonde wondered when he'd gotten so arrogant. There had been so many small mistakes that he could have, should have, avoided, things that he'd known about and just brushed off as one-time occurrences. His misstep with the Shinra Bansho was at the top of that list. The attack prevention technique was a defensive maneuver, and while that was how he'd used it for a very long time, how he'd survived his interactions with Gara, at some point he'd started transitioning towards utilizing it in an offensive capacity. Since that point, the Shinra Bansho had failed him on four separate occasions, two of which had nearly cost him his life. If Tenton or Sunad had a more vested interest in seeing him dead, he was sure the near fatalities would be four for four. For all of the attack prevention technique's strengths, stealth, becoming undetectable, mobility, it had plenty of susceptibilities. Weaknesses were things he didn't particularly care to learn about in the moment, and he found he could only blame himself for not following up on them when they'd surfaced. To use something beyond its original intent wasn't unheard of or even frowned upon, he'd certainly started taking other techniques beyond what they could do, but it would be better to test them in controlled environments, not the field. And therein lied the problem. He'd started experimenting, hoping, in dangerous situations, relying on the idea that he was good enough to get by, when in reality he had no idea if that was true. At some point, he'd adopted a mindset similar to Sasuke, to Orokimaru, and while their drive and strength were respectable, that was about all he could admire. Maybe his ambitions were, extreme, at least, compared to the goals his peers had set for themselves, but there was a line that he was still unwilling to cross, and becoming the next version of Orokimaru, as Jiraiya had seemed to unknowingly imply, was definitely past that line. As it stood, he was already treading a dangerous path towards that end. But there were stark differences, too, and his usage of the Shinra Bansho showcased that clearly. It wasn't the first time he'd been called a coward for using the attack prevention technique, but with how much had gone wrong recently, he wondered if it wasn't an apt descriptor. He'd always defended the technique as an act of prudency over cowardice, but maybe those were the excuses of, well, a coward. The thing was, the applications of the attack prevention technique were based in cowardice. Or subterfuge. Even with the breadth of his skill set, Naruto was a specialist, and in his mission against AOI, he'd thrown himself into a situation that was somewhat outside his comfort zone. Hand-to-hand -hand combat wasn't something that he was proactively interested in getting involved with, for even if he could hold his own, to some extent, it wasn't his focus. He excelled in areas that the Shinra Bansho allowed him to, as evidenced in the way he brought Sunid back to Kanoa, and to just ignore all of that preparation too, what, risk his life in an uncertain situation, seemed so, pointless. He practically shot himself in the foot with trying to prove a point against AOI. Back in the Chunin exams, he'd settled himself with the knowledge that it would take years to get to the point he wanted, and somewhere along the way, he'd gotten overly ambitious, impatient, and arrogant, and tried to move too far beyond his means. It was humbling, and more importantly, eye-opening, as to how much he'd been blinded by his own determination and recent shortcomings. He needed to step back and reinstate his original strategy, get his head screwed on straight. Naruto refocused his attention on his surroundings. At some point, Sunid had left his room, leaving only Sakura behind. 
Her back was to him, and the corners of his lips turned down in a mild frown as he watched her. It chafed a little, to see how far she'd come and know that he'd just suffered his own setback, and subsequent breakthrough, but she was also a prime example of how far one could go with the proper motivation and training. Sakura. The pink-haired girl turned to look at him. Need something, Naruto. Apparently without Sunid around to monitor her professionalism, Sakura was comfortable enough in his presence to be more informal. She was smiling at him genially. I'm, sorry, he managed, voice quiet. Naruto wasn't sure whether the words were coming off as sincere, to him, they were more thoughtful than anything else. It was wrong to, yell at you after the Chunin exams, and I, appreciate, you taking care of me here. Sakura's expression faltered for a brief moment before returning. It's fine, Naruto. You know, she continued softly, you were right back then. And I was pretty pissed for a while, but when I thought about it, you had some good points. And now, here I am, helping people and training under one of the Sanin. So thank you, for helping me to get on the right path. Naruto returned her grin with a small one of his own before he became pensive again. Heard anything from Sasuke. It wasn't that he particularly cared about his former teammate, but if Sakura had made such huge strides, maybe something extraordinary had happened to change the Uchiha for the better, too. The Kunoiki's expression immediately fell flat. I haven't seen Sasuke-kun in months. Kakashi-sensei said that he's very devoted to his training, a somber silence stretched between the two of them, and Naruto couldn't think of anything to say to fill the void, fortunately, Sakura did it for him, informing him in a semi-strained voice, well, it looks like you're cleared to go home. Take it easy with your injury, and maybe try to be more careful in the future. Sure. Naruto tried, the single word tapering off as Sakura left his room. He let out a breath of relief into the solitude, grateful to be removed from the discomfort of the hospital and the contact with his former teammate. Maybe their rapport was better now than it had been in the past, but after all that he'd just gone through, he wanted to begin rededicating himself to his trade as soon as possible. LLL. Home sweet home, Naruto thought idly, inserting his key into the door. Not that he felt any real sentiment towards the place, but the constancy of having some place to return to was nice. He frowned as he turned the key, the lack of any clicking from the tumbler indicated that his apartment was already unlocked. Opening the door, he took one cautious step into his abode and then paused. His home appeared mostly untouched except for the overabundance of green that now pervaded it. Where there had once been only a single potted plant beside his bed, the limited furniture in his apartment had been rearranged to make room for a number of different indoor plants and miniature trees. Several ferns and ivies were hanging off the walls and ceiling, and a small bonsai sat on his dresser. Even his kitchen was decorated, possessing a small tray with basil, rosemary, and a couple other herbs in it. What? A blur of white and purple threw itself at him before he could finish voicing his surprise. Naruto. Ino exclaimed, arms wrapped around his neck. You're all better. I tried to visit you in the hospital, but Billboard Brow said that you were still unconscious and kicked me out. Not like she's Sunid Sama's only student, the blonde grumbled, releasing him and stepping back. Yeah, I, ah, uh, he stumbled, before finding a cogent thought to latch upon. What are you doing here? Oh yeah. Eno started, snapping her fingers as if in sudden remembrance. Happy birthday. Naruto blinked, expression blank. Birthday. I asked Asuma Sensei when yours was, but since you were gone for it, we didn't get the chance to celebrate. But I still wanted to do something for you, and since your apartment is so empty and you like to learn about plants, I figured you might like some decorations, she explained. Sorry about breaking in, but it's not like I have a key or anything. No, that's fine, he replied quietly, glancing around his apartment. It was strange, how after living in a home devoid of any sort of sentimentality, the greenery that Eno had implanted in his apartment looked nice. The plants both suited him and made it look as if he wasn't as emotionally detached as the formerly blank walls indicated. Botany, after all, was a hobby he was well known to be invested in. Thank you, he continued, slightly amazed that he'd now uttered that very phrase twice in as many hours. Internally, he frowned slightly, unsure how to take this newfound generosity Eno was displaying. He wasn't used to people acknowledging his birthday, let alone presenting him with gifts. The last present he'd received had been, the knives Asuma got me. 
he wondered. And at least that was practical, not to mention Asuma's way to include him after giving Ino and Choji their earrings for making Chunin. Before that, it had just been infrequent treats at Ichiraku Ramen by the Hokage, Aruka, or the proprietors themselves, and Naruto had never had the capacity or state of mind to reciprocate such generosity. He slowly walked around to the different plants, trailing a finger lightly along a jasmine vine hanging from a wall. This is, really cool, he told Ino, turning towards her. You didn't have to do this, you know. I wanted to, the Yamanaka replied. I'm just glad you like it. Ino's blue eyes were shining with, something, and Naruto started to feel distinctly uncomfortable with the situation. It was one thing to use Ino and others to further his own agenda, at least in the cases of Ino and Tenten, both Kunoiki were improving as well, but to receive something for nothing, and to have that something be an object that was more personal than practical, was, uneven. Naruto wanted to believe in some semblance of reciprocity when it came to working with or getting assistance from others, because the alternative was a little too touchy-feely for him to be comfortable with, and gift-giving was the epitome of that philosophy. When's your birthday? He tried casually, idly wondering what Eno would like. Eno waved her hand in dismissal of the question, though she deigned to answer, September 23rd Road. Naruto felt a strange swell of disappointment, he'd already departed on his mission by that point, and while he could backtrack and say that he'd planned on giving her something once he returned, it would appear very forced and insincere considering he hadn't known her birthday until just now. Appearances were important. Some of his chagrin must have shown, for the kunoiki continued, really, don't worry about it. You didn't know, and I don't really need anything anyway. The jinchuriki opened his mouth to say that he didn't need any of the plants she decorated his apartment with, but then decided better of it. Eno had clearly put in a lot of effort to do something nice for him, and as unnecessary as it was, Naruto appreciated the gesture. Despite Zetsu's mocking, and in spite of his own seclusion and antisocial behavior, Naruto had friends, associates, allies, call them what he would, and didn't completely mind that fact. As much as he'd tried, he'd never been able to fully replace his old personality with the new one his strange tutor had inspired him to embrace, something he considered a personal shortcoming, instead merging the two and working with the sum total. Considering that he didn't want to become a carbon copy of his tutor, it was probably for the best that he and the former Kusanin had differences in their social lives, if Zetsu even had a social life, which the blonde doubted. Those friendships kept him grounded, Tied down, Black Zetsu would argue, and if he'd learned anything from his recent outing, it was that knowing his limitations and not pressing boundaries was important. Besides, if he was trying to stray away from the paths that Orokimaru and Sasuke had treaded, having some connections, no matter how few, was important. Okay, he acquiesced quietly. He still wasn't entirely comfortable with accepting his friend's gift for nothing but maybe he could find a way to return the favor without making it too obvious at a later date. Ino graced him with a beatific smile, and Naruto was again struck by that same sensation that she was looking at him differently than he was used to. He'd half expected her to berate him for getting hurt like she usually did, but their conversation thus far had been done in even tones, and the way she was acting was, weird. Now that he thought about it, when was the last time the blonde had mentioned Sasuke? Even after he'd pointed out the Uchiha's many flaws, Ino had been practically steadfast in her devotion to the dark-haired male, even speaking Sakura's nickname with the slightest edge in her voice. But when she'd mentioned Billboard Brow earlier, there had been no animosity, almost as if Ino had no reason to consider the other Kunoiki her rival anymore. Had Ino finally gotten over her infatuation with the last Uchiha? Naruto tried to scrutinize her unobtrusively, but couldn't immediately detect anything telltale that he hadn't already noticed and been unable to decipher. He resolved to watch her more closely in the future, curious as to the source of her change. And then there was her strange hostility towards Tenten. In parallel to his thoughts, Eno's expression turned into a mild frown, her arms settling into a cross position over her chest. Tenten got you something, too, she added, jerking her head towards the bed, clearly disgruntled. There it is again, the blonde noted. Weird. He walked past Eno to his futon, finding a fair-sized package wrapped in brown paper placed upon it. Settling himself cross-legged on the bed, he unwrapped it carefully. Cool, he thought, admiring the present. It might detract from his focus on shoring up his abilities for a short time, but in the end, 
Tenton's gift would become another trick he could add to his arsenal. LLL. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.